thanks everyone for, for being here. I have the distinct pleasure of having the graveyard, graveyard shift, uh, the, the post-lunch talk. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to, to keep it interactive. Um, especially for those of you with, with jet lag. I want to make sure that, uh, that we're awake. Um, so I want to start with the, the, the premise uh, that Professor Chen mentioned, um, which is that governments shouldn't do much in this regard, right? Governments should let the, the free markets act. So can I just take a sort of straw poll, raise your hand. Um, who thinks you know, governments should, should stay out of startups and venture? Yes. And then those who strongly believe that, uh, Marta, yeah, um, who strongly believe that governments have to act. Governments have, have a lot to do. Okay. <laughs> I, but I think that's right. And I, and I think increasingly that's the way things have, my, my instinct is that if I asked the same question to the, an audience like this 10 years ago, the answer would have been, especially in Hong Kong, would have been more the, the former, right? Governments should stay out of uh, the, the market activities. Governments should stay out of uh, startups, governments shouldn't meddle. Um, and so this, this gets to what I want to start with as, as the premise, right? So there's these two sort of universal truths. One, the governments can't pick winners, right? The governments should not select winning companies, winning industries. Governments can't pick market winners, so they shouldn't do that. The other side of the coin, the other truth, is what a lot of you have attested to as well, is that governments have to act, right? Governments need to enable an environment where startup ecosystems can flourish. Now, it's really interesting doing this talk in Hong Kong. This is also one of the countries that um, I did my PhD research on. But you know, Hong Kong has, of course, been ranked at the top of the Heritage Economic Freedom Index for the better part of 20 years, right? So this neoliberal state, this laissez-faire approach is the idea. Um, I actually don't agree with that entirely. I actually think that by the 1990s, the government here said that doesn't work when it comes to supporting venture. We have to act. We have to do something. So the question then becomes, if even neoliberal states, if even Hong Kong, and I would also argue that the US and Silicon Valley, if they're not leaving startup ecosystems to market forces, what are they doing, right? Especially in an era where we have less money, we have less government money for supporting venture, how do governments intelligently, effectively support venture? I want to, to give a, a quote as well before I move on by Carl Polanyi, a, a famous uh, economist, who has a provocative approach to this, this idea of the free market. He said, the free market was opened and has been held open by the state, by the government. It always has. This idea that the free market can evolve and can flourish without government policy, without intervention, is false. The entire premise is false. Um, it would be interesting to talk through that more. So governments want to create startup ecosystems. Ideally, sort of ecosystems that maybe don't copy the Silicon Valley model, but have the same success, perhaps. And as Yesha opened today's talks with, uh, we want to support ecosystems that are going to drive innovation and are going to drive job growth. So this is a, a recent chart from CB Insights. And if anyone, if you aren't uh, already a follower or recipient of the CB Insights newsletter, I highly recommend uh, joining their, their data and also their writing style uh, is absolutely fantastic. So this is a, a recent infographic they put together of the massive sort of inflation of unicorns, right? Of course, a unicorn is a company that gets a billion dollar valuation and it used to be a mythical idea. Now it's an everyday occurrence as, as this shows. So the idea, you know, especially if you talk to policymakers, we want to support innovation. We want to support ecosystems that are going to produce jobs innovation, and ideally, a few unicorns, right? A few uh, companies that are worth a billion dollars. In light of this, we want to help, we want to drive startup ecosystems. I've seen, so this is my, my research of, of looking at when governments launched fund of venture capital funds. That's what this cumulative uh, chart is showing. 
And in my research, I found that at least more, or over 40 countries have launched funds of venture capital funds on a national level with the intention of growing venture capital markets, with the intention of supporting startups. So I have seen this, this trend that's, you know, we see this ubiquity that supporting venture capital as a means of supporting innovation and startup ecosystems uh, is happening globally. Okay, so on one hand, we know that we want to support startup ecosystems, we want to, to, to drive, ideally, uh, unicorns, everyone's doing it. But the story doesn't end there, and that's what I want to focus my, my talk on now. There's incredible diversity in how governments and municipalities, regional governments, have tried and have successfully started uh, ecosystems and have, supported, and have made an impact in this, in this regard. So I just want to highlight three varieties or three uh, recent attempts uh, at promoting venture. So one, Startup Jamaica, uh, which has the wonderful catchphrase of get up startup. Right, so you can hear Bob Marley uh, as you read through their materials. Uh, they've effectively adapted or um, perhaps copied with a few changes uh, Startup Chile, right, which has been hugely effective uh, in supporting uh, domestic entrepreneurship in, in Santiago and Chile, but doing that by attracting entrepreneurs from all over the world. Uh, so a government-run accelerator uh, in Chile initially, and now the, the Jamaicans, uh, with the help of the World Bank, have done something similar. Uh, so accelerators uh, are one way that, that we've seen uh, a support of startup ecosystems. Uh, does anyone hold Estonian e-residency? Have you thought about it? So I, I don't yet, um, but my Twitter feed has been full of people gloating that they're now Estonian residents uh, as well. So Estonia launched something really interesting recently where they said, okay, we're a small country. How are we ever going to grow our population? How are we going to attract business? How are we going to have a bigger presence in this regard? And, and they created a program where anyone in the world can apply for and, if approved, hold e-residency which means that then you can launch your business, so you can live your life through the Estonian uh, government paradigm, if you will. Uh, so this is moving beyond land borders, and moving beyond the traditional idea of the state, uh, which I think is a hugely innovative government program. Uh, last but not least of these, the Vietnamese government years ago, actually, has implemented programming into the national curriculum. Right, so there's a, a famous visit that a senior Google engineer did to Vietnam a few years ago where someone had asked him upon leaving Vietnam, what did you think of what you've seen here? Uh, and he said, I think that Vietnam is well ahead of where the US is in terms of what they're teaching uh, their kids in terms of uh, the ability to advance in computer science. Interestingly, we, meaning the UK, even though I don't have a British accent uh, yet, I don't think I ever will. Um, in the UK, we just launched the similar computer science curriculum that Vietnam did years ago. We just launched it in 2014. So interesting to think about the notions of who's learning from whom. Okay. Um, incidentally, Vietnam has the world's largest Intel facility, uh, a billion dollar facility outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, so everyone's acting, different, different approaches to how to support venture, even amongst peers, even amongst similar countries. Right, so in, in this slide, I show that we have the VC policies, policies to promote venture capital in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. Similar instruments, but with very much different emphasis, and Different emphasis, different aims. Uh, so let's just look. And, and massive difference in the amount of money that's given. Okay, so I'll just look at the fund of venture capital fund line. Right, so the Hong Kong uh, government in, in 1994, through the Applied Research Fund, gave money to, to four venture capital managers 
and said, go out and invest in startups on our behalf, right, and gave $100 million. Um, in Taiwan, really interesting what Volcker was saying this morning, actually, that the NDF uh, launched a significant fund um, last year. Their first, first proper foray into the fund-to-fund -fund model was a bilateral effort with New Zealand, but also they had the NDF, the National um, Development Fund, investing in startups since the mid-'80s. Now, in Singapore, uh, this idea of, of investing in VC came onto the radar in, in 99, and they launched the Technopreneurship Investment Fund with a billion dollars. So let's just take a step back. A billion dollars investing in tech with the fund launched in the year 2000. Any ideas about the timing or the results of that? Not ideal timing, right? Uh, so the, the TIF, the Technopreneurship Investment Fund, was wound down, um, of course, a few years later. Um, but that didn't stop them. The Singaporean government has invested in an early stage venture fund now for two rounds uh, in recent years, where they're looking more at direct investments. So I could get into the sort of gory details of the different funds, but I'll, I'll spare you. But my point is, is that we've seen quite different levels of funding, quite different approaches um, to how to support venture, even in looking at this one particular type of, of model. Okay, so in the article that I published in the first issue of Venture Findings, actually, um, I look at this, this policy menu. Right, so what are, I, what are the 44 different tools? And we came to 44 because that's you know, mapping out the entire universe of what governments have and, and uh, could do. This is what we came up with. Um, and those 44 different policies are contained within these eight, uh, these eight areas. Okay, so I'm just gonna, going to go through this. And I hope that this will be interesting context, Marta, for your talk about Hong Kong specifically. Okay, so primarily, or, or the first, we think about government giving money to support venture, right? So, and there's different ways of doing this. As I highlighted in the last slide, we have government funding, government VC funds, government funds of funds, um, we have government loans, guarantees, grant competitions, etc. It's also important, the, the last category here is public R&D expenditure. Right? So the government's spending money on, on research uh, and development as well as, a, of course, a means of supporting venture. Taxation, uh, low tax, no tax, tax rebates, regulation. Um, this is a, a hugely important category that I think is often overlooked. Um, I was speaking during the break about, actually with, with Volcker, um, about venture in Japan. And one example that comes up of sort of what to change and to have a material impact in a positive way on a venture ecosystem comes from Japan. So the bankruptcy laws in Japan until the, the period between 2000 and 2002 were incredibly punitive. If you launched a company and it didn't work and you wanted to, to wind it down, it was very, very hard to do so. It was very hard to, to kill a company and, and to move on with your life. So you, we ended up with these zombie companies in Japan. So this has an important effect on the culture as well because instead of, so in Silicon Valley, if you've had a startup, it's failed, and you go to start your next one, you're an experienced entrepreneur, <laughs> right? In Japan, you're stuck with, an, with a zombie company forever, right? It's a, it's a failure that you're stuck with. So regulation really matters. And even policies and, and laws that can look very similar with certain changes in even well-intended ways uh, can, can be hugely negative in how they're employed. Uh, so I think this is a really important one to watch. Um, interesting that we're, that we're sitting in cyber forts um, and thinking about proximity to the science park Right, the importance of clusters, networks, and institutes, and drawing on the positive impacts that come from, frankly, being close. Right, it's it's replicating the Silicon Valley idea 
and Sinchu Park in Taiwan, uh, of if service providers, if investors and entrepreneurs are close to universities and close to established companies, we have synergies coming out of this. Um, and increasingly, we see governments making huge investments and strives in this particular category. And, and as we say, attracting talent as well. Um, I was in the other room with my research assistant uh, earlier. Um, uh, but I heard uh, the comments about the number or the, the presentation that was given on the, the percent of startup founders in Silicon Valley who are foreigners, right? So attracting the best global talent is massively important. And, and these entrepreneur visas are becoming more and more common uh, the world over. Um, and as I mentioned, Startup Chile uh, has been a really tremendous program in that regard. Um, the, if, if you haven't been to Chile and you're interested in starting a company, um, if, and just in case you haven't heard what the Startup Chile program is, effectively, the government gives $50,000, 40 or $50,000 for coming to Chile to try to build a business for a year. No strings attached, except you have to hang out in Santiago a lot. Um, but, but this is it. Um, so it's, it's not in return for any share of equity of the business that you create. Uh, the government just simply gives a, a decent amount of money. Now, the interesting thing about this is that $50,000 times a small number of the people that receive it in government terms is a tiny, tiny amount of money, right? The, the Chilean government has invested a very small amount of money in this program, but it quite literally put Chile on the world map of places that you might consider going to if you want to start a company. I guarantee before they launched their first program in 2010 that none of us would have thought, I want to start a business, I'm moving to Santiago. And so these can have a, a real impact uh, in a short period of time as well. Um, another category of, of government policies um, technology, infrastructure, and government procurement, right? So using the government coffers, using government money to invest into uh, companies, either startups that are, that are launching businesses or, or those around it. Um, in the UK, we have a really interesting uh, like open data initiative, uh, which is attempting to offer startups a huge amount of opportunity to play with data in different arenas. Um, I told you it was the, the graveyard shift. Um, okay, and stock market access. Yeah. Um, and Manny, you had mentioned this in your talk as well, is uh, you know, launching a stock market as a means of having an exit channel uh, for, for startups. Right, so there's been JASDAQ, uh, in Japan, uh, Singapore has Catalyst, launching a local capital market specific for, uh, for early stage or small companies to access capital. Um, last but not least, uh, education and training. So in this one, I just, I love the Vietnam example. You know, the changing the national curriculum so that fourth and fifth graders are taught relevant computer programs, uh, I think is, is fantastic. Um, and there's been increasing efforts in improving technology transfer uh, accelerators, incubators attached uh, to universities, uh, et cetera, and, and entrepreneurship centers in and out of uh, universities. Okay, last slide. And, and I hope that mapping out the policies of what we can do um, is interesting to think about when we, in the, in the next presentation that Marta will give, thinking about, okay, well, if this is the environment today, right, if this is the context for Hong Kong or elsewhere, what can you do, right? I, I run a lot of sessions um, with executives where I say, okay, let's imagine that you're the chief czar of technology of your country, right? You're the head of innovation, which is going to, sounds like, uh, be a real thing in Hong Kong uh, very soon. What do you do? Right? So these are the policies that you can think about uh, being within your wheelhouse. So, so how to implement these various policies, these eight categories of policies, 
how to implement them well. Right? So, so first, have a long time, time horizon. So in the case that I gave of the, the Singaporean fund of venture capital funds with a billion dollars under management, it was wound down in 2004, one, because the timing had been horrendous. But also, if you think about it, if you're investing in venture capital and you give five years before you decide to wind down, it's just an unfair time frame, right? There, you're, there, it's not possible you're going to give uh, the full run of the fund to work. You at least need to give 10 years. But and this also happens in, in Hong Kong with the, the ARF um, was wound down um, five, six years after its, after its launch. Right? So we need to have patience. We need to have a long time horizon and understanding that building, supporting venture takes time. Right? And to do that, you also have to have a certain rip, risk appetite, uh, which is challenging for governments as well, right? To, to say, we're going to put this, this money, these resources. Yes, it may, not, it may not work. Yes, we may not have tangible metrics or KPIs, but we're willing to incur that risk. Um, as, as Volcker mentioned earlier, and as uh, many increasingly say, Silicon Valley can't be copied, so build on local advantages, right? Focus on the local market. Um, there's an initiative in, in Malaysia where they're trying to make a certain parts of Malaysia. They are saying they want it to be the Detroit of Asia. And I hope they mean that in the, in the nicest of ways. Uh, I went to university near Detroit, and I don't know that I'd want to replicate Detroit, but they want to be the auto services, auto components, uh, parts of Asia. And so they have a really clear idea, and my hope is that it's focused on their local advantages and, and what exists already. Um, Co-investing with private sector is, is essential, you know, making sure that there's market relevance, that there's commercial, uh, commercialization abilities. Right? And then on the flip side of these, it's the things to avoid. Right? So over-engineering support and being too dogmatic and too prescriptive uh, and what venture is going to be. And obviously the tension here is, is real, right? So governments need to, to support and to help and to direct and to launch initiatives and accelerators, et cetera, but need to do it in a sort of horizontally open type of way, right? Um, which there's a, a lot of initiatives that, that don't necessarily do this, but are broad enough, right? So investing in, uh, in the, in green technologies, let's say. And I know the, the science park has focuses, for example, um, where, where they're interested in, in green, invest in biotech, et cetera. So trying to be somewhat focused without over-engineering. Um, the second one, if everyone could get right, uh, I'm sure that they would, but the idea of, of trying not to in, invest solely in things that will, would never have commercial uh, relevance or ability. Uh, which is a challenge, right? Because that's also what governments do. They're willing to undertake the risk and the blue sky thinking, the blue sky research that the private sector typically does not. Uh, last but not least, um, I argue to not give away your tax proceeds so quickly. Right? If there's other things that governments can do that can you know, change education and do things that don't mean taking a major hit in tax revenue. Uh, this is a, a way of supporting venture ecosystems without uh, coming at the cost of governments running with the money that they need to, to run, frankly. Okay, I close there. And uh, Professor Chan, I don't know if you want to come and chair and switch to Marta or? Yeah, maybe we can uh, that uh, Marta. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.